Welcome to Wild Lecture Online. Now let's take a look at case number two, the critically damped case. The critically damped case is the case where the damping factor equals the natural frequency of the circuit. In other words, alpha equals omega sub naught, which means that r divided by 2l equals 1 over the square root of lc. Case number two. Our graph looks like this. We see that the curve of the current crosses over at the maximum point of this curve where we have the e to the minus alpha t curve and notice then it goes down and eventually when t becomes infinite then we can see that the curves come together. All right, starting with the original differential equation we started before, like this, we end up with this characteristic equation and when we solve the characteristic equation we end up with this right here. But remember, in case number two, the quantity underneath the radical equals zero because alpha squared equals omega squared. So this simply goes to zero and then we have the solution to the characteristic equation is simply equal to minus alpha. But that doesn't give us the entire picture of the solution. We actually need to make a mathematical trick or use a mathematical trick to come up with a better general solution for this particular case. We do that by taking the very same equation here and re realizing that r over l is twice r over 2l, so therefore this quantity here can be replaced by, where are we here, 2 alpha. So I'm going to take this same differential equation, rewrite it right here, but instead of writing r over l, we write 2 alpha because r over 2l equals alpha, twice that means 2 alpha. And then notice that 1 over lc is equal to the square, or, or omega is equal to 1 over the square root of lc, so 1 over lc is omega squared, and since omega equals alpha, the natural frequency equals the damping factor, instead of writing omega sub naught squared, we can write alpha squared, and now we have a new differential equation. Instead of this, we now have this. Now here's the mathematical trick. We're going to let u equals di dt plus alpha i. Now take a look and see what we can do here. We can rewrite this entire equation as follows. We can write this as d dt of this plus alpha times this. Remember this equals u. If we do that, we can then replace this by u. We can replace this by u. And then we have a very simple first order differential equation. Now before we go on, let's verify that these two are indeed equal to one another. So first of all, the d dt of di dt is d, uh, is d squared i of dt squared. So taking the derivative of this gives us this. Taking the derivative of this gives us alpha times di dt. Now we have two alpha di dt, so one of them comes from here. Now when we take a look over here, we have a di dt times alpha. There's the second alpha times di dt, so this plus this gives us this. And finally, alpha times alpha is alpha squared times i, so you can see that this is exactly the same as what we have over here, which can now be written in terms of u into a very simple first order differential equation. Then we can claim that the general solution of u then is in the form ai e to the minus alpha t. All right, so now what we're going to do is we're going to say that u equals this and u equals this. Now, just to make sure that we know that this equation is correct, notice that du dt can be written as this. If u is equal to this, then du dt is equal to this. And so I can replace the u dt by this quantity, and this can be written as alpha times u, which is this. And notice that this does indeed add to zero, so we can see that that is absolutely a correct equation in terms of the general solution for u. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take the definition of u, which is right here, and another definition of u, which is right here, and we're going to set those two definitions equal to each other. We do that right over here, u of t equals u of t. So on the left side, we can say that u is equal to this, and that's what we have over here, and on the right side, we can say that u is equal to this, and we write that over here. Now notice instead of a1, I wrote a3, because later on, I'm going to need to change the constant now the next thing we're going to do is we're going to multiply both sides of the equation. If we do that, multiply both sides of the equation by e to the alpha t, positive e to the alpha t. So these two negate, so you end up with just an a3. This times this gives us this, and this times this gives us this. So I simply multiply both sides of the equation by e to the alpha t. And then I integrate 
both sides of the equation. If we integrate the left side, notice that the integral, oh, before I do that, one more thing, I multiply everything here, let's go ahead and do that, everything here by a dt, so that here the dt disappears, this gives an, uh, an integral with a dt, and this gets an integral with a dt as well. So I multiply everything through by dt. Now this will be the integral of di, so this simply gives me e to the alpha t times i. Here this integral will be the integral with respect to dt, so e to the alpha t requires an alpha in order to be able to integrate that. So the alpha, the alpha disappears, end up with the e to the alpha t times i. And over here, the integral of a constant is simply the integral of a constant times t plus another constant. So now I have integrated everything on both sides of the equation. Now the next thing I do is realize that these terms are exactly the same. I have two of them, so I add them together. And on the right side, I still have a3t plus a4. Then if I divide both sides by 2, I then come up with a new constant. Instead of a3, I have an, or a3 divided by 2, I have an a1. Instead of an a4 divided by 2, I have an a2. And notice on the right side, I now have an a1t plus a2. On the left side, I had an, an e to the alpha t times i. If I then, again, move this to the other side and make that into a negative exponent, I end up with this. And now notice I have a new equation for the current as a function of time in terms of e to the minus alpha t, which is that decays curve right here, multiplied times a1t plus a2. Again, all I need to do here is to find the current as a function of time, is to use the initial conditions to figure out a1 and a2. These are again two constants, but here I have the same part of the solution. This is e to the minus alpha t, which is where the curve, the cool, not the cool down curve, but in this case, the diminishing current curve is represented by this exponential part of the function, and then this represents the value for the curve, the function of, of the current, as a function of time. And so this is the case where we have case two, the critical damping, and again, the solution is found by, instead of trying to solve it like this, where you only have a partial solution to the equation, we then rewrite the differential equation in terms of alpha, we then make a clever substitution for a variable u, which represents this, so we can then write this equation as a simple first-order differential equation. We just check to see, make sure that was correct. And then since that is correct, we can solve this differential equation by setting these two equal to each other. When we do that, we multiply both sides by e to the alpha t. Then we multiply both sides by t so we can integrate every term on both sides of the equation. We end up with this. You can see that these two combine to a single term. And then we can simplify it and come up with the with the function of a current with respect to time, which is represented by the red curve here, that's a critical damping. And you notice one more special case here where it crosses over the e to the minus alpha t time at this location right here, where t is equal to 1 over alpha. And we're going to explore that aspect of it in our next video as well. And so there you go, the solution to case 2, the critical damping case.